Okay, our next session is loose clicks leak bits. Don't say that too fast, that's a little tricky. Um, but I think it's going to be very interesting, and I'm going to allow Matthew Eggers, the Vice President of Cybersecurity Policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, to introduce our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Um, I guess first, Rudy, thank you, sir, for having uh, the Chamber and me with you guys. Uh, just a quick word to kind of have folks understand where I fit kind of within the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So I'm in our cyber intelligence and security division, but mostly we've got two kind of baskets of work. The first is global supply chain security, so you can think uh, container ships, ports. We're trying to facilitate the movement of goods and keep infrastructure and ships, trucks secure. Uh, the second big basket is cyber. Uh, mostly cyber as it relates to critical infrastructure. I run a uh, cyber working group that's got, uh, gosh, 200 plus companies, associations, state and local chambers, always like that. Uh, we have a call, roughly, every Wednesday to talk about a bill or a reg or a policy issue. So uh, we're kind of dealing with both ends of Pennsylvania Ave. Um, it's my pleasure to um, kind of chair, if you will, this session. Uh, I think the thread kind of running through, I think, simply put, is cybercrime, which is very much of interest to us, the Chamber, and our members. We want to make sure that uh, our companies uh, are not impacted. That's bad for them, and that's bad for their business partners. Um, so our first speaker, uh, Damon McCoy, uh, I'm very much interested in his talk, among other things, involving intimate partner Violence. I think that captures things well. I hope it does. And then after uh, Damon, we're going to turn to Christian Judge, uh, who is going to present on who is speaking for cybercrime victims. Uh, I am going to sit and then listen. Uh, each speaker is going to uh, speak for about 20 minutes or so. I'm going to keep time. I'm going to be strict. Uh, and then we're going to do Q&A, and I will help moderate that. Uh, and again, Rudy, thank you, sir. Thanks to Comcast Georgetown. I will say this, VG is an IU grad, so is Prof Camp. I don't know where she went. Hey, go Hoosiers. But uh, glad to be here at Georgetown. I'm glad this is here because it's the first time I've gotten to this facility. So thank you. I will sit. I'll turn things over to Damon. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys for having me here. So I'm up here speaking, but this is kind of a large collaboration that spans Cornell Tech, Cornell, and NYE researchers that we've been at for about, um, probably about two years now. And I'm going to be talking about kind of a smaller piece of the larger project that we've been doing on intimate partner violence, kind of related to the role that spyware plays in intimate partner violence. And so just kind of to set the stage for this problem, um, probably some of you aren't familiar with the term intimate partner violence. The more common term for this is domestic violence. In general, intimate partner violence is kind of more inclusive, taking into account other kinds of situations where this kind of violence um, can occur within here. And so the CDC um, did a report, they did a study on intimate partner violence. They released it in 2015. They found that um, one in four women encounter intimate partner violence, and one in 10 men also encounter intimate partner violence within this. And I just kind of present these statistics because a lot of times when I talk about intimate partner violence, people think of it as kind of this corner case or this kind of more rare event in people's lives. But I think these numbers kind of show that it's not, unfortunately, that rare of an occurrence in people's lives. And um, so our project is kind of focused on understanding the role of technology in intimate partner violence is kind of the broader part of our study. Because we feel that this is kind of a, a gap in terms of understanding intimate partner violence and what's going on within here. And so, right, um, as I said, this is kind of part of a larger study. So there were some researchers that came before us and did some studies. Most of them tend to talk to um, survivors when they do these kinds of studies. So they kind of um, case studies talking to survivors. And in these initial studies, it started to crop up kind of this role of technology within here, you know, where people were um, being stalked through things like Facebook and other kinds of platforms. Um, 
sending right, harassing messages through email, texts, things like that started to crop up in these interviews with survivors of um, intimate partner violence. The other thing, unfortunately, that's kind of flared up more recently is this right kind of um, unwanted sharing of intimate images, otherwise you know, called revenge porn in here. And luckily, there have been some policy shifts and laws to kind of um, make this a little bit more risky for the abusers when they do this kind of behavior. And um, something that really is kind of, I feel, fallen through the cracks is this use of right, spyware to kind of um, right, monitor and control their victims. And so this was the component that we kind of wanted to focus in on to understand what this ecosystem of spyware is. And a lot of times when I say the word spyware, people automatically think about the other kind of spyware where right, it's kind of ad companies tracking you and selling your data and things like that. And so when I use the term spyware here, we kind of intentionally um, excluded that kind of spyware. And we're focusing on more of the kind of spyware that enables kind of personal um, right, monitoring of each other within here. So that's kind of what I mean by the term spyware when I'm talking about it. And so um, right, we wanted to understand the role that the spyware was playing in intimate partner violence, intimate partner surveillance within here. And just to kind of um, clue you in as to how I kind of got interested in this project. So in, I'm right from New York City. In New York City, we have these family justice centers. We have e one for each borough that the mayor's office um, funds and runs. And as part of these, right, they have survivor groups. And so um, my collaborators at Cornell and Cornell Tech were doing you know, studies of these survivors in these groups. And so I came um, and you know, sat in on some of these groups to kind of hear the stories of the survivors. And I assumed you know, maybe I'd hear one or two where technology played a role. But it was just um, awe shocking. Every one of them had you know, some story where technology was playing some large component of how the abuser was you know, um, monitoring and controlling them in some way. And so this kind of got me thinking that, well, this is, this is a major problem that hasn't really been looked at. And so um, another kind of anecdotal quote. So again, right, the, the researchers from Cornell Tech um, did these interviews with both the survivors and the caseworkers and other people that work within this ecosystem trying to help these survivors. And so this is just kind of an example where one of these case managers, um, she was with one of the clients, that's what they call the survivors of intimate partner violence at these um, family justice centers. And so she was having a meeting with her client and all of a sudden the abuser literally kicks in the door of the family justice center and had tracked down the client um, via some spyware that was on the client's mobile phone here. And right, obviously this led to a very tense kind of standoff from here because of this tracking. Of here. Um, okay, so um, one thing to kind of note within the spyware ecosystem, especially related to intimate partner violence, is that um, it almost turns on its head a lot of the um, threat models that we have in you know cybersecurity and things like that. Right? We have this notion of this remote attacker that's kind of far away and has difficulty getting physical access. You know, perhaps a little bit of difficulty logging into the device and things like that. And in these kinds of scenarios with this intimate partner violence, oftentimes these are very easy, right, for the abuser to get physical access to the phone, to log into the phone, and things like this. And um, in fact, the abuser might have bought the phone and then given it either to a child or to the survivor and things like that and preloaded some kind of spyware within here, right? So these are all kinds of ways that the abuser might get the spyware Onto her. We, we haven't really um, studied this aspect at this point. This is kind of the next part of our study. But we can kind of make this assumption that this is how it works. Um, so right, we, we set about trying to understand this ecosystem of the spyware that's used for intimate partner violence. And right, um, we, we kind of played the role of the abuser to see kind of what would happen here. And so, you know, as with anything that you want to learn these days, the, the first thing that you do, right, is you, is you Google 
for it. So say, right, you were an abuser and you wanted to um, spy on your spouse. So you might type in something like this in here and um, Google would deliver some, you know, results kind of informing you. So the first result is a blog post comparing the different spyware apps and their features and things like that. The next one is a how-to video on how to install the spyware and make it so that the um, survivor can't detect the spyware on their phone. The next one is um, it's essentially a fake blog that just serves as a funnel into a spyware company. So this is um, typically an affiliate marketer. A lot of these spyware companies have affiliate marketing programs within them. And these affiliate market programs allow their affiliates to kind of abusively market the spyware. And then they can kind of wash their hands of it and say, you know, it's not us advertising it for you know, stalking and things like that. It's our affiliates in this case. And then um, sometimes you do see the actual direct spyware developers advertising their spyware for this kind of usage within here. So, so this is the kind of the, our, this was the first thing that we found when we started the study was this, and this kind of shows you the levels of problems that occur within this ecosystem. And so um, this is an anecdotal example, and so we kind of scaled this out by essentially um, using you know, various techniques to spider out and discover other terms that abusers were likely to do within here. And we took advantage of you know, recommendation engines that Google has within their products. And so um, to kind of get to the punchline, then I'll kind of walk you through this story, is right, unfortunately we found kind of this abundant resources of various kinds of spyware on both um, Google's platform and on iTunes' platform within here. And so um, we found 32, all of these were off-store apps. These are ones that are really hardcore spyware apps that have a lot of nasty kind of functionality within them. And um, we also found on the stores, on Google's Play Store, we found about um, 3.5 thousand of these what we call intimate partner um, surveillance relevant apps. And I'll get into more details as to what I mean by this, but essentially it's apps that could potentially be used to surveil an intimate partner. And um, we conducted a smaller study and we found a little under 500 of these apps that might be used for intimate partner surveillance on I, um, Apple's iTunes store. So um, I'll kind of walk you into through some of the, um, what we found within here. And so this is, this is the hardcore off-platform kind of spyware stuff. So this is um, SpyZ, and right, this here's some of the marketing material for SpyZ. So right, it works on both iOS and Android devices. It can grab SMS, call logs, chat messages, GPS signals, it's right, it's ideal for monitoring and potentially controlling someone within your, um, most of these will run either on a jailbroken or unjailbroken phone within here and right, the, the key part is they're, you know, they're hard to detect on the phones. So they're very covert and they're monitoring within here. And um, so I guess we, we hit SpyZ during the Christmas season. So they normally have Christmas sales for their spyware. <laughs> okay, and um, right, so this all adds up to this real time kind of historical tracking of these things and these remote kind of monitoring capabilities that the spyware gives you. And um, they also provide these interfaces, so they provide these easy to use interfaces for the abusers of these kinds of services. And again, right, they normally work both jailbroken and unjailbroken. If you're able to jailbreak the phone, then they're able to monitor kind of app communications within apps like Facebook, um, WhatsApp, Snapchat and things like that, if you manage to jailbreak the phone, if you can't jailbreak the phone, then they can monitor like the SMS, the camera, the call logs, and um, other kinds of things like that, the GPS obviously as well. And so, um, right, they provide a lot of customer service for their customers, they provide how-to guides that say how easy and streamlined the process is of installing the malware on their systems. And um, so that's what kind of the off-store stuff looks like. So we wanted to also identify and then study some of the on-store stuff that could potentially be used for this. 
So um, you'll have to kind of trust me on this. I'll just kind of run you through this quickly. But we started with the searches. We you know, did some mystical machine learning on it. We cleaned up the machine learning with some human people to make sure that we were really finding relevant um, spyware apps. And we came up with a set of these 3.5 thousand. And then we kind of um, stared at these for a while, and we put them into several different kinds of categories. And so the on-store ones, right, there's the personal tracking things, the find your phone, fitness tracker, and things like that. We're in here, right, that would be good for um, location monitoring. We found these mutual tracking kind of apps, the couple tracker, and things like this. And then we found kind of some subordinate tracking apps that you know, were marketed for monitoring children, employees, um, things of this kind of nature within here. And right, the, the problem with some of these seemingly kind of innocuous apps is that we were finding them oftentimes recommended when people were seeking um, app solutions for monitoring their spouses and things like that. So this is an anecdotal post where right, someone is looking for some spyware to monitor their wife's phone without the wife knowing about it. And someone in the forum helpfully um, suggests that they should install Cerebrus. So Cerebrus is an anti-theft app um, that's very stealthy, because right, if your phone gets stolen, they want to make sure that the person that stole it doesn't find Cerebrus and uninstall it. It has lots of functionality, cameras, so you can take a you know, picture of the person that stole your phone, GPS monitoring the works, and things like this. And so then um, they go on to say right, that it's very easy to install, and best yet, it can you know, record audio and camera, and it's very silent in its functionality of these things. So this is just one example of many that we found on these forums, where what we call these dual-use apps are being recommended for this use case of intimate partner surveillance. Um, so right, so the so again, right, we have these really nasty off store ones, and then we have these dual use kind of spyware apps within here. And so right, the next thing that we wanted to kind of understand is how the developers were marketing these apps. So with these op store ones, we found a lot of evidence of just blatant advertising for this use case of intimate partner surveillance within here. The, unfortunately, the projector is a little bit fuzzy, but that bottom one is a picture of a man. She's restraining a woman, and the woman has bruises all over her face. And they're recommending the spyware to catch a cheating spouse within here. So this is just one of many of these very creepy things. I saw another one where they had this couch, they had a woman with her cell phone, and then this creepy guy like staring over the couch looking at the cell phone. So um, very much some of these companies are actively advertising for this use case. There's another class of these developers that um, aren't directly advertising it, but are kind of implicitly condoning this use case of their software. So publicly, they'll, you know, they'll say that it's a child monitoring app, an employee monitoring app. But then right, you'll see things like these blogs that are oftentimes done by the affiliates that then will connect to these um, spyware apps that are supposed to be labeled you know, as you know, child monitors or things like that. So we saw lots and lots of cases of this where there's basically developers kind of implicitly condoning this kind of use case while not directly advertising for it. Um, the other thing we found, right, is paid advertising for these apps on search terms that kind of indicate that they, right, that they're condoning this intimate partner um, surveillance kind of use case within here. So these are child monitoring apps that come up when you type in, you know, track cheating boyfriend and things like that within here. And um, Another way that we tried to measure kind of the level of condoning that these developers were is that we rounded up 11 of these that didn't um, explicitly advertise for the you know, intimate partner surveillance case. And we contacted their customer service kind of acting as an abuser. So we would straight up say, right, that we wanted to you know, install this on you know, our husband's phone without them knowing that's installed. And so um, nine of the 11 developers responded, and eight of them basically condoned it in some way or another when we talked to their customer support 
Ohm, right? We got things like this where they basically said that, yes, this is the perfect tool for you know, monitoring your husband without them seeing it through the technical support. Um, only one of the nine that responded actually admonished us and said, no, this is illegal. You should not use our, our software for this use case. Um, we did another one where we posed as the victim and we contacted them saying, you know, we had this spyware, please help us remove it. Um, most of the ones that did respond said, this is not possible. And so we had to argue with them and then we finally gave up. Um, one of them just said, we can't help you, sorry, within your, so none of them helped us um, try and remove the spyware when we were posing as a survivor of this. Um, so, right, we, we had the study, so we did a disclosure, we disclosed to both um, Apple and Google, only Google responded to us when we did the disclosure, so um, Google did react and tried to make some improvements. So they had some policy changes. So those um, ones, those mutual tracking apps that I showed you, those have all been removed from the Play Store. Um, Google changed their policy to no longer allow those kinds of apps. Um, they did a review of all the apps that we found, all the dual use ones, and um, some of them were removed, and some of them, they made them change the functionality of their apps because of this. Um, also in terms of paid advertising, they removed all the paid advertising. So you can no longer pay to advertise on terms that are you know, indicating that you're seeking to do um, intimate partner surveillance within here. Um, unfortunately, Apple, like I said, never directly responded to us. There were some New York Times articles and stuff like that, and they just kind of, um, some nonsensical answers from their PR people, and apparently they won the PR war by just spewing out nonsense <laughs> within here. So, um, right, the platforms oftentimes have a big role. Within this, um, the other thing that we wanted to look at is, right, there's these anti-virus um, kinds of tools that can detect these kinds of um, apps potentially. So we rounded up a whole bunch of the IPS apps that we found. We ran them through a whole bunch of these and unfortunately we had very poor detection rates for these. They, they did a reasonable job of finding the really hardcore off app spyware stuff, but none of them detected any of the kind of dual use spyware type stuff. So um, unfortunately, right, we're left with kind of the state of the art in spyware detection. So this is oftentimes what um, people that work with survivors and stuff like this, this is kind of advice that they give them is, you know, is the battery draining quickly? Is your phone heating up? If so, you might want to just dispose of the device. So this is unfortunately kind of the state of the art within here of detecting this sorts of stuff. So like I said, um, this is a product that we've been doing for about two years and we're going to um, kind of keep at it. So moving forward, we're, we're working with Google and we're working with Symantec to try and roll out a reasonable detection tool that would um, actually help people detect this sort of spyware. But it's not an easy thing. Technology is not, we can't offer the magic box that will solve this problem. It's going to take a lot of training to use this kind of software, um, working with the platforms, I think, and other kinds of things to help this. And the other thing, right, is that we're going to attempt to work with the developers and also the OS manufacturers and things like that to try and improve their OSs so that they're not as easily abused. And for the developers that do want to listen to us, we can give them tips as to how to make it harder to use their um, software for abusive kinds of purposes. And so we have a website. We post most of our research and some of our tools on here. And with that, I will leave it to the next speaker. David, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I have a pit in my stomach. I don't know about any of you. That's hard to follow. Thank you, Damon, for the amazing work that you're doing. And we hope to partner with you. Um, We've been looking for resources on helping domestic violence victims, and there really isn't a lot out there. So this is a whole new field, and I'm glad you're, you're working there.
So thank you, first of all, to Georgetown, Comcast, and the other sponsors for this great event today. I have learned so much. Uh, I'm sure all of you have, too. I have spent the last 10 years uh, working on cybersecurity education and awareness, but I'm not a technologist. In some ways, that helps me a lot. Uh, I can speak a little bit of technology, but not enough that it goes over folks' heads. So I call myself an interpreter a lot. I got into cybersecurity because I was a county commissioner in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I sat next to a gentleman at a National Association of Counties meeting, and he asked me if I would help him teach elected officials about the importance of cybersecurity. Well, I'll tell you, in 2009, most elected officials didn't know what the word cybersecurity meant. So it was quite an uphill battle, but we've come a long way. Uh, and while I was a commissioner, I was doing some cybersecurity education awareness in our community because three students in our high school had been affected by online predators. And as an elected official who ran on public safety, I felt like that was important for me to do. And because I was in the paper talking about cybersecurity, one Friday evening at 8 o'clock, a young gentleman called me and said, my sister's being harassed on Facebook and I don't know who to call. So I called my sheriff and I said, I'm so sorry, but I'm now bringing this to the forefront here. Where do they call? In the sheriff's office. And he said, well, Kevin knows some stuff about computers, but, but they really didn't have people ready to handle these cybercrime issues that were coming their way. And we haven't, unfortunately, come very far since then. So we created a nonprofit called the Cybercrime Support Network. We've been working on this for about four years now, but we became an official 501c3 last year, and we are speaking for the cybercrime victims. And I'll tell you which types of victims we're speaking for. When we think about cybercrime statistics and all the numbers and threats, it's usually about enterprise that we're talking about. You know, we hear all these you know, big ransomware stories and ha the targets, Target hack and Home Depot hack and all of that. But who's talking about the grandfather who got a phone call or a text message or a Facebook message that said, Grandpa, it's me, Joe, and I'm in prison, or I'm in jail, I got picked up. Can you please wire $11,000 so I can get out? I'm really scared, this is the only call I have, here's where you have to wire the money, or I can't get out of jail, I'm really scared, Grandpa, please do it right now. So what is a grandpa gonna do? They're gonna go wire $11,000, and they're doing it every day. And then they're embarrassed when they realize that it wasn't their grandson, and they don't wanna tell people because they're afraid that their adult children will think that they're not capable of making good decisions and maybe they'll start taking away their money privileges or their access to things, and it's just a downhill slope from there. Then we have the small business owner. Been in business three or four years, has a great customer base, and they get ransomware. Or their Yelp is uh, accosted and, and there's terrible Yelp reviews go up, or someone takes their website and puts pornography on it for three days. Now, is someone going to trust that small business? Are they going to go back to that small business? Do they have uh, a data backup that's clean so that they can keep, keep their business going? Who knows? Where are they going to go to get help? And how many of them are going to go to business because their reputation is ruined? Who's helping those small businesses? And then there's those folks who are on the computer, like my dear father, who's probably watching. Hi, Dad. Uh, who uh, had a Microsoft tech scam call, a gentleman called and said, your computer's not working. I've gotten these, dear friend of mine has gotten these. I know many, many people who have taken those seriously. When someone calls and says, your computer's not working, but I can help you, I've got really good antivirus. You stay on the phone with them for a couple hours, you let them into your computer, and then at the end you pay them the fee for the great software that they just gave you. Where do you go then to find out, once you realize something bad happened, where do you go to get help? Well, fortunately, my father called me and we had him go to the Geek Squad and get his hard drive wiped. But if you're a technologist in here, I bet you get these kinds of calls every day because I can see some people nodding their head. Well, I want to help you with that. I don't want those calls necessarily going to you anymore. This is a multi-billion dollar industry. Just in America alone, we can estimate by looking at the Federal Bureau of Investigations Internet Crime Complaint Center, last year they had 300,000 complaints from Americans. Those 300,000 people lost $1 billion. And we're estimating that's about 15% of the actual number of victims. So I'll do the math real quickly for you. It's about $8 billion a year that consumers and small businesses may be losing in America to cybercrime. 
That's an economic issue. That is a mental health issue. That's a stability issue for families and businesses. This is something that needs to be addressed. But we haven't been counting these people. We don't really know how many there are. And you can't really take care of a problem if you can't have the data to go along with it. I was speaking to Michael Daniel, which I'm sure most of you probably have worked with in, in your time here in DC, who was uh, President Obama's White House Cybersecurity Director. I'm, I know it's not his exact title, sorry, Michael. Uh, and he said when he was in the White House, one of the most common questions he received was, I've been hacked, where do I go? Who do I call? And he would say, I don't know. I can't really give you a good answer. For these folks that we're talking about, we're not talking about the target. When they get hacked, they know where to go. The FBI swoops in. They've got Secret Service. They've got all kinds of help. The US CERT, the NKIC is all involved. But we're talking about the bakery down the street or my dad. Where did they go? It's a pretty difficult maze for people to navigate if they do start calling agencies. I was speaking to an FBI agent who gets calls from people who lost $500. And he has to say, I'm sorry, this is the FBI. If we took every $500 call, we wouldn't be able to go after the $100,000 losses and the crime rings and, and these other issues. We can't help you. Or then they'll call their local law enforcement, the city police or the 911, and they'll say, I'm sorry, we don't have anybody here to take that for you. We're working, thanks to some financing and grant money from Comcast, we are doing national research on how many turnaway calls are there in our national 911 dispatch centers? I talked to one dispatch center director and he said he can turn away zero to 100 calls a day. Guess which month he gets the most calls for cybercrime that they have to turn away? April, exactly, Matt. April, IRS tax scam. They get bombarded with phone calls, but those poor dispatchers who are in Dispatch because they want to be public servants. These are people who don't like to say, hi, thanks for calling 911. I can't help you and hang up on them. But they're doing that sometimes 100 times a day. So we want to take those calls away from those folks and get people to where they need to be. This is part of the problem. The, I call it the hotline landscape. Another messy, it's the hotline issue. <laughs> These are just some of the hotlines we randomly found by Googling where can I call if I've been a victim of fraud or cybercrime, and uh, I appreciate our US Senate Committee on Aging's Fraud Hotline. That hotline gets 1,200 calls a year, and they write a 40-page report on it. So I think we might be better served if all of these calls are starting in one place, and then they get to the victim advocates that can actually help them, and we can count them because none of these folks are all going into the same pot of data so we know how many people are actually affected. We do have a model to look at. The UK, we looked all around the world and they are the first country that has one number to call if you're a victim of cybercrime or fraud. It's a national number, but they're ahead of us on the legislation. They have federal legislation that gives jurisdiction to one law enforcement agency. The City of London Metropolitan Police has jurisdiction for cybercrime and fraud. So the calls start in a $35 million security operations center. We don't have that either yet. And then they get sent to the local law enforcement if there is a response, and they get the help that they need. I was in a room one time with an FBI agent, a state police cyber commander, and a county sheriff, and they asked me to create a jurisdictional mapping for cybercrime. It doesn't exist. They say the calls, wherever they come first, we figure out if we can help. If we can't, we send them to the next guy or gal. So we don't even know who has jurisdiction over which types of crimes. We're, if you, someone else does know and has a map for us, please share, because we are researching this hard. But because of the nature of cybercrime, 50% of the calls that go into the UK system, there's no law enforcement response. For the typical Microsoft scam, loss of $300, the, the caller was probably calling from some third world country, there's no, the law enforcement isn't going to do anything because they're not going to catch the perpetrator and they're not able to get your money back. So you just need some hand holding and some advice. But if we look at 100,000 of those calls that come in in one week nationwide, we might be able to connect the dots and then law enforcement can come in and go after the perpetrators. So what we want to do is make a straight line from the incident to the resources. 
Let's not let people get lost in that maze. So we've done some research, again, thanks to Comcast, to figure out what people want. First of all, one out of three people in our study were impacted by cybercrime. So that's a lot bigger than probably the percentage that is reporting to the FBI or the Federal Trade Commission. We appreciate what they're doing. But most people, when I was a county commissioner, didn't even know they had a county commissioner. Did anyone here know their county commissioner? So our state attorney general's offices have great resources. But who thinks to call their state attorney general necessarily, the general public? If you don't work in government, you don't think to call the FBI on a Tuesday because your business got hacked. So people don't know where to go. When we asked them where would they like to report, they preferred a phone number, like a 911 or a 211, a short, easy phone number that was locally answered that they could call and talk to a human being. Because going to a federal website and filling out a federal form with all of your personal information right after you've been hacked is not very intuitive. Then we also asked them, um, what did you do if you had been a victim of a cybercrime? One in four just did nothing. And the reason was they felt like there wasn't anywhere they could go, so they just didn't even try. The folks that went directly to the bank or to the organization or the company that they were hacked on or in connection with, they had the best response, but not everybody thought to go there. So if we can get them to call us first in one centralized number and then say, yes, you need to call that bank or you need to call that company, they'll help you. They have help available. That's going to help. 91% believe that law enforcement should know what's happening. And the law enforcement was broad. It wasn't necessarily your local police department. It could be FBI, state police. So the law enforcement group, they want them to know that these crimes are happening. 91%. That's a pretty high statistic. So we have some solutions. The first one is our website that we are launching, uh, hopefully October 15th, I'm going <laughs> to say, because our operations person is here and probably thinks maybe, it's, maybe October 20th. Sometime in October for National Cybersecurity Alliance, fraudsupport.org will go live. There's nothing there right now, and this is not the actual wording, but I wanted to give you an example of what this site might look like. People will go on the site, and they'll be able to click on a button that said, this happened to me, identity theft fraud, online shopping incident, uh, my business was hacked, whatever it may be, something in those top 10 to 15 categories of the most popular cyber crimes that are happening to folks in America. And then they'll go to the next page. And that next page, if it's identity theft, will say, which kind of identity theft? There's about four or five key top identity theft types, medical identity theft, social security identity theft. So based on that, they'll answer one more question, and then they'll get to the resources. What should I do? Who should I call? And how should I recover? We're going to make it very simple. We're going to focus, uh, test it with focus groups in the next couple weeks to make sure that it's intuitive and understandable. Doesn't look like a government site necessarily. Again, this is not a, a knock to my friends in the government. Um, I appreciate them, everything that they do, and I work very closely with them. But the typical American doesn't think to go to one of those sites. Now, we are going to send folks to identitytheft.gov, done by the FTC almost 100% of the time for identity theft. It's an amazing site. They have a fantastic resources, a step-by-step -step guide on how to handle identity theft. But they're going to come in through here, probably, and then get to that site. And, and we, don't, we don't have any idea that we want to create the resources. We're just going to pool those resources that are out there that already exist, that are fantastic, and help people get to them. We are the triage. We are the connector for these victims so that they don't feel like they're on their own and they're not going to four or five or six different places and being turned away and then just giving up. We have to pay attention to this $8 billion problem in our country right now. These people are hurting. And when you talk about domestic violence victims and senior citizens, especially the seniors who are falling for romance scams, many of them are suicidal. So our second part of our solution is to utilize the existing 211 network. Does anybody in here know what 211 does? We're very fortunate. Uh, we may not have to, in our lives, uh, connect with 211. But 211 is a human services referral line, and it covers almost 95% of Americans right now. So if you live in Washtenaw County, where I live, you can call 211 if you don't have enough food to eat or you are going to be homeless, or you're a prisoner re-entering the community and you need clothes, 
or you can't pay your electric bill. They have a list of millions nationwide of nonprofits and county government and folks that can help those in need. So people don't stay on the phone with them for advocacy or to help them through all of the issues. They get them to the place they need to go to get the help they need. And this, this already exists. We have about, I think it's about 110 211 centers. And I want to make sure everyone knows, do not have cybercrime victims call there right now. They are not equipped for that right now. I always have to make sure that we make that very clear. But what we're doing is starting some pilots in four states using federal victim dollars to, number one, train the 911 dispatchers and the 211 referral specialists on how to triage these crimes. Number two, we're building a database of resources based on where you live. So if someone calls from Ann Arbor, Michigan, 481, whatever the 08, we'll know, is there a local law enforcement response for identity theft, for example? Some local jurisdictions will send someone to your house. If you've been a victim of identity theft, they'll give you a packet and they'll write a police report. But if you live in the county next door, they don't. So we'll have that in our database and all the two and ones will be able to access that database and find out what resources are available. Then there's states that have cyber command resources and then there's federal government resources that'll all be involved in there. There's the Elder Law of Michigan, for example, AARP has resources, all kinds of great stuff, all those hotlines I showed you earlier. But they'll be in one database and we can direct people where they need to go. So we're training 911, training 211, we're building our database and letting them access it and then we're going to do a public service campaign educating the public in those communities when we're ready to start by calling 211 to get to where they need to go. But one of the most impactful things, aside from helping the victims, which is our number one goal, is we're going to have a form, one standardized form, using machine learning uh, created by Arbor Insight to have folks fill out the form on our website so they can report the crime or they can fill it out with a 211 agent on the phone and the 211 agent will fill it out with them. And that form is gonna be reported to our partners at the Cyber Threat Alliance and then also to the federal government agencies who have databases where uh, law enforcement can access it. So when this is a national program, can you imagine, we actually will be able to put our hands on the number of how many people are impacted by cybercrime and how much money they've lost and get them the help that they need. This is a huge problem that isn't being addressed, but with all the partners we have at the table, we're actually gonna be able to make a difference. We're so thankful to have uh, federal agencies working with us, private sector working with us, uh, technologists, non-technologists, the domestic violence community. Uh, we've been called in to work on training for domestic violence advocates and law enforcement on the intersection of cybercrime and domestic violence. There's so many needs out there. And being the only nonprofit that's really speaking for these victims in, of cybercrime, we're getting pulled into a lot of discussions. So if you want to work with us, please let us know. There's my information. And we're very thankful to be here and thankful to the leadership of Comcast for helping us do what we're doing. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate both of those presentations. Um, a lot of my work deals with uh, critical infrastructure and cyber, but you know it's interesting. I just had a colleague who sits next to me in my office. He had um, almost fallen victim to uh, some bad actors kind of getting in an email exchange between him and some repair people. And he got a call saying, hey, you're supposed to wire me monies about the repair. And it wasn't the repair people either way. And then he said, hey, what do I do? I said, you know what? I should have a really good answer for you, but I don't. I said, here are a few things. And essentially, I think the best outcome is, one, you didn't wire any money. And two, hopefully the data that you share will be uh, used to, to paint the picture. Uh, let me tee things off with a question. Damon, where's that software, the spyware? Um, typically produced here overseas. Um, how do you see policy kind of impacting this? I can see some in industry saying, hey, we don't want to maybe have some products affected that are loosely associated. I don't know the market that well, but you can see that. I'm sure you've heard it. How do we get on top of this problem? 
Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, some of these, we did try and figure out where they were. Some of them, you, I, I worked for like a day or two and you just couldn't find anything about them. Um, some of them are domestic. And so Senator Blumenthal actually wrote um, some questions to some of the developers. And apparently they've sent back their answers. I haven't seen them yet, but they, they have answered the questions that his office put forth. And some of it was you know, around, what are you doing to safeguard your apps from abuse within this ecosystem and stuff like that. So. I, I, that's very good. I think, uh, I think that that issue probably will remain. Um, I don't think it's something that uh, a lot of people probably think about, um, probably because it's somewhat, individuals aren't as forthcoming, right, about being maybe a victim. Uh, Kristen. Um, you said you're going to launch your site soon. Um, how many partners do you have? How big is your organization, staff, and so forth? We are small but mighty. We have our chief operating officer, Carolyn Munoz, is here. And we participated in the Hiring Our Heroes program. So we have hired a military spouse through the Department of Labor program as our director of communications. And then we have three contractors. So we're a team of about six right now, and then we bring on folks to help write grants, that kind of thing. And as our federal grants come in, those are allowing us to hire new folks. But we are about to announce a few more private sector partners. Mm. But to keep our corporation up and running, we need private sector dollars because the victim funds won't necessarily pay for our services, but they'll go to the 211 centers to make sure that they have enough people to answer the phones, which is where that federal dollars needs to go. Well, I'll tell you what, when this is put together, I'd like to be able to share your information with our members so Thank they're aware you, of the uh, opportunity for their, for their uh, businesses and colleagues to get plugged in. Thank I want to be mindful of our uh, clock here. Uh, we're supposed to be finished by about mm, now, <laughs> but um, maybe we can eat just a minute or two into the time if we've got a question or two. Yes, please. I think there may and be also, a mic. I'm, I'm going to be around for the happy hour, too. So. Happy to answer questions then. Maybe one or two, and then we're going to break for a, a break. Hi. Um, my name's Layla Sloan. I'm with Bank of America, but in my spare time, I volunteer at a domestic violence shelter and hotline in Arlington, Virginia. So my question is for you. Um, when calls come into our hotline and when we bring people into the shelter, we track a lot of information about them, the type of abuse they suffered, um, more demographic information. Have you approached any shelters or... Uh, organizations about tracking information on uh, spyware. I had a call just over the weekend where uh, an abuser had put a tracker in the a woman's car and was able to find her that way. But there's nothing on my documentation other than my narrative to track that. Right. So um, most of us being in New York City, we're, we are working closely with the um, Family Justice Centers. And we're, we're piloting some things to try and train people there on how to deal with these issues better in terms of questionnaires and materials that they can give to their clients when we're doing this. And we're trying to build out some tools and things like that mm -hmm. as well that we're testing to detect the spyware better mm -hmm. within here. Um, but yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of these groups. And so it's, I think, very critical to get some good information and also to get a better, larger understanding of this. So we're going to start scanning the client's phones in New York City um, shortly to try and get some baseline measurements, but we would certainly like to expand this. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. One quick one, if we've got one. Yes, please. So, two questions for both of you. Excellent talk, by the way. Really enjoyed both of the uh, talks. Um, Damon, one question for you. Uh, have you worked with a tool called Hybrid Analysis? CrowdStrike actually acquired them. It's a European uh, company that does right. scan of mobile apps. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could actually tell how it gives a score to each of the mobile apps, the APK, uh, whether it's on the Android or on the iOS, that really allows the end user to make a confirm, you know, informed decision about the problems with the apps that they're installing on their phone. I think that would be a good source in terms of making sure that Agreed. which apps are good and which apps yeah, are not good. We'd have to see. Yeah. A lot of the problems that we found with the spyware is that they simply just aren't cognizant of this threat model mm -hmm. and the danger of these kinds of apps. Yes. So it would be interesting to see if hybrid analysis is. I think 
highly recommend it. Okay. So I think that's a good tool to use. Now, coming back to your uh, presentation, um, I'm wondering um, how much the, the data that you'll be collecting through this effort is going to be priceless from my point of view, because I think you could really tie it into a broader fraud and scams, yeah. um, especially within the... Um, you know, financial industry and, and some of the fraud that takes place. I'm wondering if you're working with any of the um, big financial industry players. We are. So we'll be announcing our first large national bank, and their CISO will be sitting on our advisory board. And he has promised to send me to one of the other CISO council meetings to introduce me to the other banks. And we're also working with the amazing team at the American Bankers Association. And we want to make sure we get their tools out to seniors, especially. They have a great senior program. But yes, and it's just a matter of, to be honest with you, to Matthew's question, if we had more bodies, once we have more funds and we have more bodies, we have a list of you know, 30 or 40 people we really should be talking to right now. What we're trying to do before the website goes live in October and before the pilots start, I'm trying to make sure we're talking to the key institutions like the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the National Sheriff's Office. Uh, Comcast brought me down to talk to the E911 board in Florida uh, Tuesday. I want to make sure they hear it from us first. So we're trying to get to those critical groups first, DHS and we, FBI we've been working with and so on. And then we have that list. And certainly the financial industry was one of the keys. So having that CISO on our advisory board and, and having him open up, yeah. But we want to be able to share that data, not only with private industry, and certainly the PII will never be shared, um, with private industry, with the ISACs, but also with the academic researchers. Because the researchers we've talked to in cybersecurity say, we can't get any of the data. So we're going to make sure that the data that we're collecting is something that everybody can use while still taking care of privacy. So I think it's really critical. And with that, let's finish and let's give our speakers a hand.